As a geologist, I believe the rocks beneath our feet are fundamental to civilizations around the world. I'm taking a tour of the Pacific Rim, stopping off at some of the most dramatic, diverse and rugged landscapes on the planet to see how human history has been shaped by the rocks. My journey includes the awesome peaks of the Andes, the perilous volcanoes of Indonesia, and the breathtaking landscape of Japan. In this program, I'm in California, where I want to find out what makes millions of people put themselves at peril in the path of geological devastation. California is one of the most geologically volatile and dangerous places on Earth. Every day, people that live here are under constant threat from devastating earthquakes that cause billions of dollars worth of damage. Landslides that sweep away entire towns. And terrifying firestorms that can whip over suburban hillsides at over 70 miles an hour. I study these geological hazards and I'm intrigued to know why Californians are prepared to live with the risks and how we cope with them. What's going through their minds? And is risk embedded in the culture? To find the answers to these questions, I'm going on a 3,000 mile journey around California, the most populated state in North America, through searing salt pans and deserts frozen mountain heights and narrow canyons, all the way back to the time of the gold rush. It's a journey that will go back 150 years in human history and millions of years in geological time. As with all the places I'm visiting around the Pacific, California's landscape has been created by huge geological forces. I'm starting out from San Francisco, a city that's long attracted fortune seekers from across the world. I'm heading east to discover what brought them here in the first place. Traveling across California, you realize that the landscapes are as diverse as the people who live here. A contrasting mishmash of fertile valleys and barren deserts, deep canyons and towering peaks. My first stop is up in the Sierra Nevada foothills, the starting point for modern California. It was on this ordinary river in 1848 that a carpenter by the name of James Marshall made a chance discovery that would transform California forever. In fact, I'm underselling it. It would transform the history of the world forever. Marshall was one of the first few white settlers in the area, and he was here to make a living out of lumber. He'd been trying to stop timber from blocking the flow of water passing through the sawmill, and his solution was to blast a deeper channel with explosives. Hopping down into the blast zone to check how much sand and gravel had been removed, his eye caught sight of something glittering. He picked it up and examined it, and in his hand was something heavy, very heavy. Marshall had discovered gold. Just here, near the town of Bridgeport, there's a whole string of hot springs and they help explain why gold was found here in the first place. This pool is called ha Travertine Hot Spring and oh, the water 
it's really warm even though it's freezing out here. And it's this heat that tells me that there's hot rocks down below. Those rocks heat up water underground and force it up to the surface, creating these pools. Because the water's hot and under pressure, it dissolves the rock, forming a kind of mineral soup. But not all the water makes it all the way to the surface. Sometimes it gets trapped in cracks and fissures. And as it cools, its cargo of minerals and elements gets precipitated out. And amongst them is gold. The gold in Sierra Nevada has been exposed by weathering, making it relatively easy to find. Ice, water and wind erode the rocks. Over time, they're crumbled into fragments and get washed down the mountains to form the beds of streams and rivers. And some of that crunched up rock contained fragments of gold, which ended up in the hands of the likes of James Marshall. Here in the Sierra Nevada in the 1850s, the gold was just lying in the stream beds waiting to be picked up. The easiest way to find it was to sift the sediments with a pan. Ed and Norm Allen are brothers who've spent countless hours working this river. Okay, Ed, what, what do I do here? Well, first you've got to get some dirt in your pan. You're going to get in as deep as you can and pull up a load of material. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start shaking this pan back and for forth pretty violently. And what that's doing is it's getting the gold down in this crevice at the bottom of the pan here. The reason that that occurs is the gold weighs so much more than the rock that it's in. So it sinks down. That's correct. So I can start washing this other material out of the pan. This is a long process. Yes, it is. 50 pans a day were considered about all a man could do. 50? 50. 50 pans a day. Wow. It was hard work. The temperature in this canyon gets to over 100 degrees in the summertime. It doesn't feel like it today. No. This river's been pretty cleaned out. People pan over where we're panning almost every day. So do you really get gold in here? Yes. Yes, we do sure do. do there's, yes, there's gold in this river. You want to see some gold from here? Yeah. Let me put my pan down. That's you. Look at that. That nugget was found right here last March. Wow. And how much is that worth? About $90. And that's 23 karat gold right out of the river. Norm! Uh, <coughs> Norm! I think I've got something. Oh, yes. That's very nice. That's very nice. Good. That's at least a clinker. A, cl a clinker. A clinker. All right, Hear it's it? a sign. <laughs> That's a beauty, all right. I'll be having that then. Fine as keepers, it says in that sign That's up there. That's what it says. Thanks. That's great. Sure. My That's pleasure. That's a nice one too. Yeah. Well, I'm going to keep going, actually. I think you've got the fever. Yeah, it's absolutely. The addictive. gold fever. I know. It's completely addictive. Ugh. Within weeks of Marshall's discovery, people were running through the streets shouting about gold in the mountains. From all around the world, thousands began pouring into what was then the tiny coastal port of San Francisco and working their way by hook or by crook into the mountains. The dramatic red cliffs at Malakoff Diggins look natural, but they're one of many huge quarries the miners left behind. Historian Jim Henley has explored how risking everything to make a fortune became the bedrock for the modern Californian mindset. Oh, sure. It's, it's an illusion to think that miners were grizzly old men. They're young men coming from the East Coast who grew up in a technological environment, and they had concluded that there's a lot of gold here, but it's not big nuggets. It's little fine dust. And by the end of 1848, it's a business, it's an, it's an industrial operation that requires the scale that a single person can't do. 
Within a couple of years, the pans and picks were replaced by mass mining on an industrial scale. A quarter of a million miners were to reshape the Californian landscape. But how did this ambition to make money transform the culture of California? Big towns like San Francisco and Sacramento become the supply centers to these miners, and there becomes a culture of mining the miner. There's more money to be made in supplying the miner with his needs and relieving him of his gold <laughs> than there is to be made standing in a stream that's yeah. cold or standing out in the rain like we are here. It's, it's nasty environment doing this. And the infectious nature of mining as a risk-taking venture infected the merchants in the same way. It was okay to take big risks. So you had this growing commercialization very fast, lots of entrepreneurs coming through and then is it a real start of a risk-taking culture? It is a risk-taking culture, and that is, that is what it's really all about, because nobody is here to criticize you for making a mistake. Mm. You look around, everybody else has made mistakes, and they get up and try again. That's okay. Mm. And so that's the mindset. And it goes from the miner to the banker to the commerce and commercial people right through the line. So it was in this culture of anything goes freedom that the Californian mentality was born. And it was all down to the geology, down to gold. was a geological jackpot that transformed California into a magnet for risk takers. In fact, they took enormous risks just getting to the gold fields in the first place. California is loosely divided into three, a low range of mountains along the Pacific coast, a wide fertile central valley, and in the east, the biggest mountain range in the state, the Sierra Nevada. This virtually impenetrable mountain range was a barrier that filtered out all but the most determined of gold seekers. And it's easy to see why. Towering above me is Mount Whitney. At well over two and a half miles high, it's the tallest peak in the continental United States. Crossing the Sierra Nevada really was a formidable task and one that forged a pioneering spirit. But further south, the trails could be even worse especially here. Death Valley, a 250 mile long desert, one of the hottest places on earth. The thousands who flocked westward in 1849 became famously known as the California 49ers. Some of them tried to shorten the route by cutting across Death Valley. For the early pioneers that saw this landscape, which to me is absolutely magnificent, it must have been absolutely terrifying. Stumbling into uncharted territory, the emigrants wandered about for weeks in this barren waste of dried up lakes and weird salt formations. Once here, it was virtually impossible to escape. This is bad water, the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, 85 metres below sea level. Certain times of the year, you do get water here. It floods in through some of these canyons and transforms this place into a shallow lake. But the trouble is the water can't get out. It just evaporates away, leaving behind all this salt. Just like those early pioneers, it's easy to get into these valleys, but really difficult to get out and dig on to the gold fields beyond. Death Valley is so dry because it lies in the rain shadow of the Sierra Nevada mountains. 
Clouds coming east from the Pacific dump their load of rain as they pass over the cold mountain heights, leaving the air dry and clear here on the other side. The stranded pioneers only just made it across, having killed their oxen for food and burned their wagons to cure the meat. It's legendary adventures like this that became woven into the Californian risk-taking psyche. Ghost Town. Elevation, two and a half thousand metres. Population, zero. This is what greeted many who came to make their fortune. A harsh mining town in the middle of a mountain wilderness. Prospectors the world over were blinded by the slim possibility of making a better life wrought from gold. For many though, this was what lay in wait. A tough life bitter isolation. In the year following Marshall's discovery, a hundred thousand so-called 49ers poured into California, and towns like these sprung up throughout the state. It was here that these young, ambitious men came to gamble with their futures, and although hopes were high, the odds were stacked against them. You may think James Marshall was a lucky man, but he wasn't. He was just one of many for whom gold would bring nothing but broken dreams. He didn't own the land where he made his discovery, and his sawmill went down a pan as soon as all the able-bodied men were dazzled with the hunt for gold. Although the chances of success were small, miners went to any lengths. Many who came risked everything and ended up with nothing. On my journey, it's becoming clear to me how the rush for gold laid the foundation for a risk-taking culture. Thanks to the geology of California, the ultimate home of the American dream was born. If you took a chance, the world could be yours for the taking. With the construction of the Transcontinental Railway in 1869, it was suddenly no longer a five-month ordeal to get here. And as if gold hadn't drawn enough risk-takers to California, there was another geological jackpot to pull them in. I'm on Highway 150 near Ojai, Santa Barbara. And right here on the roadside, this black gooey stuff is oozing out of the hillside. It's a naturally occurring tar, and it's a sign that beneath these rocks lies another fortune spinner, black gold. Kern County in the Central Valley sits on top of one of the largest oil fields in California. The whole landscape here has been completely transformed into a vast sea of oil wells. The scale of this is absolutely immense. There's something like 50,000 oil wells here. And they give you an idea of how massive the oil field must be underground. They pump out about 220 million barrels of oil every year here but there's still 3.5 billion barrels left in the ground. The crude oil here formed from plankton that lived on the surface of the ocean over six million years ago. As they died, they settled to the ocean floor. They were covered with a layer of mud, eventually breaking down into compounds of hydrogen and carbon, the building blocks for fuels and plastics. The whole of central California is one enormous valley, the San Joaquin Valley. And its formation is key to how the oil got here in the first place. 
This area used to be a huge section of seabed that's been lifted up by geological forces. And as it was raised up, the sand and silt layer that contained the oil was bent and contorted, trapping the oil and leaving it down in the ground, ready to be tapped. So the richest land-based oil wells in the United States were formed thanks to the forces of geology. Just like the influx of the 49ers of the gold rush, thousands poured into the state in search of their own gushers. For some, it would become a personal passport to instant wealth. With all that oil and the gold before it, this state had an ingrained mentality of commercial risk-taking and speculation. Huge numbers of money-minded entrepreneurs poured in, selling everything from Levi's jeans to cars. New industries are often regarded as risky because they're trying to find a footing in an uncertain area of commerce. But in California, cutting-edge ideas were embraced. And this made it the perfect place for new ways of making money, like the movies. People say filmmakers came here because of the great weather and fabulous locations. I'm sure there's something in that, but it's not the only state with good weather. Just as important is the bedrock of innovation. A culture that was open and hungry for new ideas, new industries and creativity. The natural place for an upstart industry like film. And that culture continues today. Silicon Valley is the largest concentration of high technology in the United States. Just like the gold, the oil and the movies, it's no surprise that this 20th century industry emerged in California. New high-tech ventures can be just as risky. Think back to the collapse of the dot-com boom. But if you are successful, the rewards could be huge. In California, you really can turn up with nothing and become a self-made millionaire. Thousands have done just that. So it's no surprise Californians are so positive and have this who dares wins attitude. But what I want to know is whether this explains why they're prepared to live with geological peril. To dig deeper, I'm heading back to San Francisco. Jutting out into a natural harbour, you'd think there couldn't be a better place to build a city. The early settlers probably thought that too. At first sight, you get that same thrill of excitement that must have greeted the immigrants. When the first miners came running through the streets in 1848 with bags full of gold, there were only 800 residents. Within two years, there were over 30 times as many. Today, San Francisco has all the hallmarks of the liberal open-mindedness that grew out of those early gold rush days. Japantown, Chinatown, Russian Hill and the Italian Quarter, they all reflect the worldwide influence of the gold rush. These streets look great in Hollywood car chases, but I'm amazed that they even considered building a grid system on such steep slopes, let alone a network of cable cars. In a culture where anything is supposed to be possible, this must have seemed like a triumph over nature and all that troublesome topography. But Mother Earth has dealt a cruel blow to San Francisco. All 43 of her hills and 800,000 residents lie right across the most geologically unstable zone in California. 
the San Andreas Fault. In 1906, a colossal earthquake tore through San Francisco. The city was almost completely destroyed, leaving over half the population homeless and at least 3,000 dead. Today, inhabitants are still prepared to take huge risks, even though the warning signs are right under their noses. Just south of San Francisco, in Hollister, you can see what happens when a fault cuts right under people's homes. If you take this wall here, there's a lot of cracks in it. There's one running across here, there's one down here, right across. Here's another one, that's a big one. And the whole thing gets twisted around and also bent down. In fact, there's a steep slope in the garden where the fault line passes through and goes off, crosses the pathway, and it continues on to the side of the road. And at the side of the road, the kerbstone is offset. And there's a little crack in the tarmac which continues off. And if I don't get killed here, over in the old kerbstone, yeah, there's a bend and this is all broken. The fault crosses the park as that gentle slope and it literally slices the neighbourhood in two. The Earth's surface is covered in giant plates which float around on a plasticky interior. The whole of California is one big collision zone where two of the plates meet. The San Andreas Fault carves right through California, where the Pacific Plate is grinding past the North American Plate. Several kilometres beneath my feet, huge stresses are building up. As the enormous pressure builds up as the two plates try to move, eventually the rocks can't take it anymore. The friction is overcoming, the two plates move and slip past each other. And that's what radiates out massive seismic waves, the violent shaking that we feel during an earthquake. San Francisco is rocked regularly by terrifying earthquakes. One of the worst was in October 1989. At 5.04 p.m., there was a huge earthquake at Loma Prieta near Santa Cruz. The quake killed 63 and injured nearly 4,000. I'm close to the spot where a double-decker highway, Interstate 880, once stood. It wasn't designed to withstand the huge stresses created by the buckling and shaking earth, and it collapsed. If it wasn't for the fact that there was a World Series baseball game on TV, it would have been gridlocked with rush hour traffic when the earthquake struck. Even so, 42 people were killed when the upper concrete tier collapsed down on the lower one, crushing the vehicles. So why are people in California prepared to live with this kind of geological threat? Is this all down to a culture of risk-taking? Or is something more subtle going on? Someone who's been looking into these attitudes is psychologist Dr. Christine Rodriguez. Well, the California culture has had um, a risky streak um, probably since 1849 with the advent of the gold rush, but this uh, risk-taking culture um, does not really have anything to do with the riskiness of the physical environment here. There's earthquake risk, there's uh, wildfire hazard uh, risk, there's landslides, there's floods, there's droughts, uh, you name it. But that does not have an impact on the culture so much because people's perception of risk is very faulty. People tend to not understand probabilities very well. That's what keeps Las Vegas in business. You know, you talk to people about what is their retirement plans, and they'll say, well, I'm counting on winning the lottery. And the chance is less than being struck by lightning in the state of California, but a lot of people really sort of think of that as their retirement plans. How do people in California then feel about earthquakes? Do they, they accept as a risk there? They do accept them but most of the time people just tune it out. They want to live here and earthquakes come with the package and they just would rather not think about it. It's a denial mechanism and people use denial mechanisms in many parts of their life to avoid facing things that are very um, unpleasant, like a conflict with their boss or with their children. We tune out the risks that we're taking getting to our car to drive to work. We just assume not think about it. 
but sometimes that nervousness about the environment is still there. So what we'll do is displace it. And so everybody in uh, California seems very, very concerned about um, uh, uh, tornadoes in Oklahoma or hurricanes on the Gulf Coast. Um, and when I was uh, visiting Puerto Rico, the big thing there, instead of focusing on uh, their earthquake hazard and on their hurricane hazard, they were fascinated with earthquakes in California. So, <laughs> so there's a basic human trait to misjudge risk. But yes. This is particularly bad when you live in such a perilous environment. Yes, um, we have so many risks to perceive inaccurately, so. There's undeniably a, a history of risk taking here when it comes to making money and fortune seeking. But when it comes to geological disasters, it seems like Californians aren't risk takers after all. It's more that they avoid thinking rationally about the odds in the first place. And I don't think it's unique to Californians. With natural disasters, our mind plays all sorts of tricks on us. We avoid thinking about life's dangers in order to cope with them. When we, we bury our heads in the sand, when we don't really realise that we're doing it. Unfortunately, this, this human trait may leave many Californians unprotected from the real sources of danger. You'd think that with such a catalogue of disasters behind them, Californians would be more prepared for catastrophe Instead, they seem to carry on as normal. Somehow, the lessons of history have been ignored. This is the San Francisco Canyon, site of one of California's worst catastrophes. Built in the 1920s by engineer William Mulholland, the St. Francis Dam was one of several crucial water supplies for Los Angeles further south. But on the 12th of March, 1928, the dam gave way. A 10-storey wall of water surged towards the Pacific, wiping out everything in its path. The flood destroyed 1,200 homes and over 500 lives were lost. A disaster second only to the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906. It's incredibly eerie to revisit the site of such a devastating disaster. It's also quite difficult to know what goes where. It's a bit of a jigsaw here. I guess one side of the dam was over there and it swings over where we are and goes to the other side in the shadowy ravine there. These massive concrete blocks are all that's left of the dam. The remains were blasted away with dynamite, almost as if to erase the memory of it forever. These huge chunks are all that's left at the front of the dam. The side facing downstream away from the reservoir was built with a series of concrete steps and, and here they are lying on their side like giant tombstones. To find the reason why the dam failed, you have to clamber up above the dam site itself onto the steep sides of the ravine. This is probably the spot where the dam gave way. And you can see why when you look at the rock. This is a rock called schist, which is made up of lots of little slippery layers. You can see them glinting in the sun. This whole slope is made of those same slippery layers, which are pointing down slope. and probably just gave way, took the dam with it. So with weak layers of rock forming the dam's eastern foundation, it's not surprising it gave way. The steep valley sides were in fact the result of an ancient mega landslide. So the entire mountain was a vast mound of rubble. The valley that Mulholland thought was so ideal for a dam was because of those weak rocks underfoot riddled with landslides. You can see them all around here disfigured in the grassy slopes. Well, Holland accepted all the blame for the disaster, telling the coroner that he envied the dead. He resigned, and seven years later, he died, a virtual recluse. The tragic story of the dam disaster should have been a warning that much of the rock in California is unstable and susceptible to devastating landslides. 
but it seems to have gone unheeded. Similar mistakes have been made to this day, right next to people's homes. I'm travelling along the Pacific Coast Highway, north of Los Angeles. Landslides happen somewhere along this stretch of coast every few years, but it doesn't seem to stop people living here. With the Californian population ever increasing, more and more people are spreading along the coast, and competition for a piece of the idyllic Californian lifestyle is driving people into the danger zone. Steep slopes made of weak sedimentary rock are found all over California. I'm standing on a mountain of it. 200 meters of sand, silt and gravel. And down there is La Conchita. Sandwiched between the Pacific Ocean and steep walls of crumbly sedimentary rock, La Conchita had been a disaster waiting to happen. Early in 2005, the Californian coastline endured a record-breaking winter storm. It rained continuously for five days, so that the ground became completely saturated with water. One January afternoon, the hills above La Conchita suddenly gave way. Nearly half a million tonnes of debris slid down the mountainside, ploughing into the community below. Ten people were buried alive as a wall of mud engulfed their homes. Virginia Costas watched from her upstairs window as a landslip careered towards her home. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a train, but it was much too loud to be the train. So I looked out my window, and that's when I saw just the mountain moving with uh, fences and right. treetops and bushes and garage doors. The street was covered, so it hit the top story windows of my home. Wow. And there's, there's crosses and things like that. So I guess. Houses under there? I mean, what's the story? The houses were buried, uh, people were buried, 10 fatalities. And ten. the, yes, 10 and the emergency workers lived in my home for a week. And what they dug out were crayon books and Halloween costumes and the things of daily life. I don't know if you were aware of the story of the Wallet family, but um, they were staying here temporarily with my friend Charlie, who owned the house across the street. And he um, lived in his bus temporarily to give them a place to stay. His wife and three children were in the house, and he went down to the store. That's when it occurred at 1.30 in the afternoon. They were walking up the street just like you and I just walked up mm. when the hill let go and buried his children and his wife. So he saw the thing come he down. He saw it come down and bury all five houses. Charlie lost his life and his friend lost his family, his wife and his three children. On this street, we all had birthdays December 1, 2, and 3. Charlie's was the first. Maybe it's understandable that after nearly a century, people forget about historical events like the St. Francis Dam disaster. But here at La Conchita, there had been a much more recent warning. The hillside had already plummeted into the town 10 years earlier, burying nine homes. Miraculously, no one was killed. Despite this near miss, people went on living in a danger zone. My father lives here. Uh, full-time. He wanted to come back to the house. He helped me repair it mm. and expects to be here um, with the risks. He thinks it's worth it. Others have sold because Los Angeles commuters would like a, a beach house and have purchased the properties knowing the risks. So this is still a place that people want to buy? <sighs> yes. And even the street? The house next door to me was sold three months after the slide. In March, the slide was January. They know they're buying a house at the base of a landslide zone. Correct. But just go up 10 minutes up the, the road and fixer-uppers started a million dollars with a view like this. Gosh. 
It's got an amazing kind of hold on people, this place, isn't it? It does. It does. You stay here any longer, it'll hold you too. <laughs> <laughs> so why do people cling to their homes in the face of certain danger? Somehow lessons from history about landslides seem to have been forgotten. Dr Susanna Hoffman is an anthropologist who's found similar stories all over the state. California, in a funny way, has been a cutting edge of coastalization. Tons of people moving to the coast right. for good life, um, the view for the recreational activities. And it's part of the good life has also led to this incredible unbridled development in which any private piece of land could suddenly become 25 lots or 300 lots and people will move into it. It's a cultural illusion that we can have good life and there is no consequence, there's no price, there's no risk here. In Lacanchita we've had these repeated landslide disasters but people still want to live there. Why is that? Actually it's one of the hardest things to understand. It, we call it place attachment. In disasters people repeatedly go back to where it was before, even if there's extant danger and they know it's going to happen again or they're aware that, that it's very likely. So now also, as well as place attachment, you get the fact that it's somebody else's responsibility to make everybody safe and that the government or somebody should do something about it. But it's becoming increasingly clear that people have to take some responsibility for the acknowledgement of the extant dangers around them. Society has to understand that they can't put up a wall, they can't change a beach, they can't protect against the waves. There's no physical solution to disasters. The solutions are social. Instead of learning from repeated disasters and moving away, people prefer to live with the risks. They look for a safety net to protect them. But I'm not convinced it's a battle you can ever win when you're dealing with Mother Nature. I can't deny that California is breathtakingly beautiful. The views from the mountains down onto the Los Angeles basin are world famous. People are prepared to pay any price for a house on a hilltop. But is it a price worth paying? If earthquakes and landslides aren't bad enough, there's another catastrophe just waiting to sweep over these hills. In October 2003, a fire exploded into life in Southern California. Freak conditions had coincided to create a towering firestorm that stretched from LA to the Mexican border. It was the worst wildfire in California's history. Nearly 4,000 homes were destroyed and 24 people lost their lives. Houses are continuing to be built in areas where raging fires are a dead certainty. They're inevitable because here, the environment, the, the landscape, the climate, the vegetation is primed for them. The steep slopes of Southern California's mountain ranges form an ideal habitat for highly flammable brush vegetation called chaparral plants. There's some common ones here, this one, it's called chemise. It's the most abundant and flammable plant in Southern California. And dotted around here is a lot of sagebrush. The unique thing about them isn't just that they've adapted well to hot Mediterranean climates. It's that over thousands and thousands of years they've evolved to live with and, and benefit from a good fire. They actually require it to stay healthy. Chaparral plants contain oils and resins that actually promote fires, and most contain seeds that won't germinate until after a fire. Plants like these have evolved so that they're not destroyed by the flames. Many of them have a large base or root crown like this. The top of the plant burns, but the root survives. Within weeks, the, the crown has started to sprout and grow again, and after about a year or so, it could be up to four feet tall.
south-facing slopes become extremely hot and dry because they face directly into the sun. As hot air rises, it preheats the vegetation above, so the fires spread even faster. The steep terrain accelerates the fires in other ways too. Canyons funnel air currents, and ridges increase the wind speed flowing over them. Each year, the hot desert Santa Ana wind acts like giant bellows, blowing westwards directly towards people's homes. In 2003, they fanned the inferno into a 10-metre wall of flames, blasting them faster than cars could drive to get away. 14,000 firefighters were called in from across the USA. The fire raged for days. Only when it reached the sea did it finally run out of fuel. So why do people here continue to build in the fire belt? Author Mike Davis has observed some very interesting attitudes. People tend to have a, a schizophrenic attitude toward the landscape. They regard the landscape as a benign, sunny, given environment uh, until something happens. And then people tend to have an overreaction, a paranoia. So here you, you have people living in an absolutely controlled environment. Every aspect of their environment has been carefully planned and regulated, and it's wholly artificial. But right next to them is these chaparral-covered hills. So you can live in a landscape like this for 30, 40, even 50 years before it burns. But when it does burn, you get catastrophic fires. So the view from the backyard is looking at the equivalent of a lake full of gasoline or, or, or crude oil, but it has the power to sweep away this entire uh, development. Are people in this, these communities surprised when wildfires burst up in their, their midst? Well, probably with the exception of a few old timers, most people are hysterical. They're always searching for anyone to blame, not on the location of the housing or the ecosystem. They want to see the hand of an arsonist lurking in the trees or the bush, the maniac with his lighter in his hands, although it's almost immaterial whether there's an arsonist or not, given enough fuel mass, enough unburned chaparral, uh, wildfire happens. Uh, that's the message the landscape's trying to tell the, uh, the suburbs. It seems like what has to be told is those communities have to be told you can't do that, but that's very much against the Californian mindset. Well, of course it is, or rather it's against the culture of people who still want to imagine they're living on the Jacksonian frontier, that they have this kind of untrammeled personal freedom to uh, ride their mo motorbikes or drive their four-wheel drives, to live in big homes. Everything about this form of settlement is contradictory and ironic and, in, in my way of thinking, ultimately unsustainable. Uh, after a while, what you end up with are dead bodies as a result of this. It seems staggering to me that people have ignored these lessons for over a hundred years. Today, seven million people live amongst the chaparral. The lure of somewhere beautiful is simply too tempting. But if we can blame people, not nature, the threat seems somehow more controllable. With over 500 miles of freeways in LA, you can't go anywhere without a car, which means only one thing. Heading back to LA, you realise why so many people head for the hills. This traffic is terrible. You have to admire the positive attitude of the people here. But sometimes, it's almost as if they feel they're invincible. And there are signs of this way of thinking all over the place. If 
building homes in the fire belt as an act of faith, then take a look at this. This cathedral is built almost entirely of glass, but it sits just like the rest of LA, alongside one of the world's most dangerous earthquake zones. Nothing can really quite prepare you for this dazzling piece of religion turned showbiz. Built in the 1980s, the Crystal Cathedral towers 12 storeys high and is made from 12,000 glass panes. Regardless of what you think about churches and religion, there's no getting away from the fact that this is incredibly impressive. I'm still not sure I'd rather be standing here in a big quake though. Remarkably, according to the cathedral's founder, Reverend Robert Schuller, it's designed to be earthquake proof. The world's leading uh, consultant on builders and architects when it comes to earthquake proofing structures mm. is a Christian and he's been my guest here. He said, if you know an earthquake is coming, let me tell you, run into the cathedral. Oh, that's comforting. That's, that's the safest building in all of California. Wow. Barring none. It symbolizes what at the heart a true Christian should become. The prayer is, Lord, make my life a mirror to reflect your love to all I meet and a window for your light to shine through. So can you get, like, through prayer, avert natural disaster? Is that, is that possible? Well, I don't really... I can't say yes, but I'm not sure that's the right answer. But all I can say is I went through a disaster when uh, our farm home was the center of a tornado. We escaped with our lives, but everything, all of the animals, all of the buildings, all of the crops in the field were sucked up and we never saw a hair of it again. And uh, you never look at what you've lost. You always look mm. at what you have left. It's that positive outlook. Absolutely. The, yeah. What's the option? Yeah, yeah. What's the alternative? No, absolutely. I just See, wonder if, if in people in, in Los Angeles yeah. that are very, good, very um, strong Christian beliefs, I, I'm just curious as to whether they are praying against earthquakes or, or, or what? Oh, I don't know. I never pray against earthquakes because I have no control over them. And I don't think uh, God's in the business of creating them and launching them. If he is, that's his business, and I'm not <laughs> going to try to defend him. <laughs> At first glance, this would seem to be the ultimate image of Californian trust in God. It's designed to withstand a major seismic shake, but to be honest, if you were at all worried about earthquakes, you wouldn't choose to build everything in glass. Instead, this seems to cry out a very different kind of statement. It seems to shout out a triumphal message of invulnerability, a confident defiance in the face of disaster. To me, it does seem like a brazen symbol of the Californian belief that man can conquer nature. Maybe he can. But time will tell. For the end of my journey, I'm heading back to the mother of all make-believe, home of the disaster movie itself, Hollywood. In my travels, I've come across plenty of different ways in which people escape from the reality of geological disasters. They misjudge the odds, they forget history all too quickly, they blame humans for natural occurrences. But I have to say that there's something weird about escaping the reality of geological disasters through the Hollywood fantasy of disasters. Here at Universal Studios, They've actually turned the whole disaster movie experience into a ride which you can relive again and again. I'm meeting up with James Ulmer, author and movie journalist, who knows all about the blurring of fact and fiction on the silver screen. Universal fantasy. <laughs> this is what we do. I'm going to take you into the heart of this colossal set, stop in the tram for a few moments to allow you to take some amazing pictures. Hang on tight. I have your cameras ready. Why is Hollywood fascinated by the disaster movie. Here we are at the War of the Worlds set. 
Tom Cruise in this movie plays a character who is an emotional cripple, okay, who is healed by disaster, okay? And the only way he can rescue his family is to go through disaster and come out the other end. Americans like to see that because we are so desensitized to everything around us, especially in California where we all go around in SUVs. We amputate our legs because we drive a car. The SUVs are like huge tanks. We celebrate the whole idea of um, being so desensitized to the world. It's not that the disaster films make us less sensitive. Oh God, no, the movies follow life. I don't think they, they, they push us toward anything, but I th think they do celebrate the fact that you know, we're cutting ourselves off and the only way we can feel anything is to be tilted in a tram and going into the pond. <laughs> He's a bit tamer these days, I think. Yeah, plexiglass. <laughs> plexiglass. One of the things about disaster films is that no matter how big the disaster and how awful it is, society pulls together in the end. So it creates so, social cohesion. Almost. Absolutely. I mean, if you talk to people who lived through the, the riots in Los Angeles, which were in 1994, You'd think, oh my God, it was it was horrible. There were floods, there were fires, there were you know people were burning down the buildings. Most of the people who lived through that, and I was one of them, it was our favorite time to be in L.A. It was the only time where people drew together and found a common cause and could really relate to each other on an individual basis. The idea that you know there's a whole industry built around this is something that I think just helps us cope with it. This is, this is what I mean. I'm completely jaded to this. It's just used to this, is it? In, in California? In California, unless you have... That was a 4.2 earthquake. Unless you have a 6-point earthquake, you know, I give a seismic yawn. <laughs> So is it only really movies that make Californians sit up and take notice? Maybe the land of make-believe is the only way they can acknowledge the risks around them, at least until the next catastrophe. The geology, gold and then the oil, has shaped a Californian mindset, which I have to say, I really admire. It's free thinking, optimistic and adventurous. Because of the Californian geology, you can live the American dream. If you're successful, you can have whatever you want. But it seems to me that it's just a cultural illusion, because that same geology can turn the dream into a nightmare. It's the same story all round the Pacific Rim. If you can't suffer the downsides, you can't enjoy the benefits. More from the intrepid Ian Stewart in Peru next Wednesday at 9. Tonight, drama telling the story of Laurel and Hardy, how they met, worked out their act, fought bitterly, but remained the closest of friends. That's Stan, next. Why?